and good afternoon and welcome to Vulcans Football 2015 for the wrap-up of week four of the Vulcans football season. Uh, I'm your host Gary Smith. Uh, I'm joined once again this week uh, in this early morning by Sports Information Director Matt Kiefer. And Matt, before we start uh, talking about Vulcans football, uh, break down the American League East for uh, all the Toronto Blue Jays fans out there like yourself. Well, I'm probably the only one in the area, um, but <laughs> right now the magic number is two entering play today, so looking at good shape and have the top spot in the uh, American League record-wise, so no Cardinals for us to worry about. Now, the big question is going to be, should it happen to be the uh, Pirates and the Blue Jays in the World Series, where, where do your allegiance lies? Well, there's no question. It's <laughs> north of the border. Uh, I just hope the idea I can maybe find a way to get somebody in Pittsburgh to give me a ticket, at least for maybe... <laughs> Only 500 times the ticket price instead of 1,000 uh, or 10,000. And I know we're getting ahead of ourselves there, but that'd be a, it's nice to think about. I mean, it's been a long time since both the Pirates and the Blue Jays franchises can think uh, postseason and also the ultimate goal of uh, the World Series. But enough about uh, baseball. We're in the heart of uh, the 2015 college football season in Matt, California. On uh, this past Saturday, made a trip, an earlier trip than uh, I'm used to going up to Edinburgh, uh, to start their PSAC West uh, portion of the season against the Fighting Scots in a game that uh, was played on a beautiful fall afternoon and a game that was a lot closer uh, than I think a lot of people would, uh, would have assumed going into the game. And we'll see later with the scores. There was a lot of that going on in the PSAC this weekend. But let's just talk about, about Edinburgh, California. It's a little closer than people thought might going into the game, but got the win and started 1-0 in the West. I mean, the top goal for the uh, program always is to win the West. So to do that, the best way to do is just win every single game in the West. Uh, so he started off 1-0 with a win at Edinburgh. It's one of those things, typical fashion, you get an early lead. Uh, two early touchdown runs by John Franklin. Uh, then the offense opens a little bit more. Good to see Gary Brown back in the action there. He caught a touchdown pass in the second half. Got some offense going in that, that portion of the game where the last two weeks uh, people have been wondering what happened to the offense. But it's just one of those things, they really milked the clock, almost pulled a Bloomsburg effect in the second half. I think they controlled the ball for about 19 minutes. Uh, almost, it was just ridi uh, ridiculous for looking at Cal's numbers to what they normally are from last week. Uh, big ground game for the Vulcans, over 300 yards rushing. Uh, James Harris did enough through the air, uh, but Edinburgh just wouldn't go away. That's a typical kind of game with the Fighting Scots. Scott Browning always has those guys ready to play. No Harris brother underneath the center, but uh, Jake Sisson did his best uh, impersonation, and Darren Massey uh, proved why he's one of the top wideouts in the PSAC. And where our truck is parked at Edinburgh is right next to the, uh, the Edinburgh locker room. And you could hear during pregame, the pregame uh, speech by Scott Browning. He basically was treating this and telling his team to treat this like the Super Bowl. They really wanted that game, especially since he as a coach has never beaten California. Uh, and California did a great job early in the game of uh, fending off that, that momentum. Uh, you mentioned Gary Brown playing. It was kind of like the, the old, I think it was Willis Reed for the Knicks whenever he dressed for the one NBA Finals game. We were setting up. Uh, it was kind of like, hey, Number nine's dress for California. That that excitement went through our crew, and then whenever the Cal fans started coming into the game, they saw number nine was dressed, and that, that added a spark for sure. I mean, it's one of those things. Uh, Kawan Scott, uh, Luke Samori, all those guys in the wide receiver core stepped up their game last week, and even a little bit, probably basically the half against Bloomsburg after Gary went down. But anytime you get an All American back, uh, you'll gladly take it. It just makes everyone else's job a little bit easier on offense, and it gives the defenses so much more to worry about having two guys on the outside that can really uh, burn you deep or just on slants. And you have Luke Samori underneath, Desmond Green. Uh, it was kind of disappointing to see Luke Rapchak wasn't able to play this week, but uh, Paul Butler should be coming back hopefully in a couple weeks to give the Vulcans even more offensive weapons. And you mentioned uh, Luke's morning. It seems like every week we're talking about a nice touchdown pass over the middle. We'll see those in the highlights in a little bit. And the ground game was uh, really effective on Saturday. It was, it was a quiet effectiveness, if that makes sense, because at the end of the game when we saw that Franklin had almost 200 yards of offense or 200 yards rushing. We knew he had the three touchdowns, but they were, you know, less than 10 yards each. You don't realize just how effective that, that ground game was from the whistle to the final gun. I mean, any time you get uh, a running back to go over 100 yards, you really like your chances. When you get a guy close to 200, you really like your chances. And that's something I think the Vulcans uh, made a conscious effort to do, try to keep that run game going. Jimmy Wheeler stepped up, had a big running game as well. Derek Fiore had a couple of nice runs uh, for the Vulcans. They got the nice three-headed attack. I mean, last time the Vulcans ran for 300 yards was that Lake Erie game in 2008. You and I remember that one. The announcers <laughs> had to go literally to about the fifth or sixth string running back in that game because everybody was getting 40, 50 yards rushing. So it was a little bit more concentrated in uh, Franklin this week than that one was. Uh, but still, anytime you get that kind of rushing attack, I mean, it really puts more on film the teams have to worry about uh, going forward. And not just Franklin in the backfield. You have Wheeler as well, a little bit of thunder and lightning because Franklin was the more they churn it out, get the tough yards, consistent, consistent, consistent. But it seemed like every time Wheeler touched the ball, he was – 
in open space. Uh, and there were a couple special teams plays he made that were unfortunately called back due to penalties. But it seems like every time he was touching the ball Saturday, uh, something was happening. He's one of those guys who's a spark plug. He's an X factor. Uh, he didn't play the first two games of the season, but since he's come on the last two weeks, he's one of those guys when you get the ball, everybody's going to stop basically and watch what he does. Uh, I mean, he was very highly skilled in high school. He led the Whippoo in rushing as a senior, almost broke the all-time Whippoo rushing record for a single season. So that tells you when you're looking at the Whippoo, they've had amazing running backs over the years. And for him to even challenge that record, it tells you this kid's got special talent and it'll be exciting to see him play out the rest of the season. And on the defensive side of the ball, you mentioned Luke Rakchuk was out uh, – uh, of the game on Saturday, but uh, the rest of the defense and the first half shut Edinburgh down. But with that offense, Edinburgh, you know, take the record aside. I mean, without a win this year, but they have some weapons. That wide receiver Massey put on a show, and he was covered a lot of those times. It was just a good individual effort by him. I mean, Massey, uh, he's a junior now, uh, but he was a PSAC West freshman of the year, his freshman year, which been the same year Gary Brown came. And um, so, I mean, you look at those two guys right there, two juniors that are coming back next year uh, for the PSAC. Those two will definitely be battling, I'm betting, this year and next year for uh, first-team all-conference nods and recognition for all-region and maybe even all-American honors. But, I mean, uh, anytime you have a guy like that, it definitely makes everyone pay attention to him, but it also opens up for uh, some other things as well. Uh, some of the other receivers are able to get some big games. Even the quarterback, uh, second week in a row, the Vulcans face the quarterback who can take it down and run a little bit when they need to. So that's something you have to be careful of going forward because every team in the Peace Act seemingly has one of those guys who can at least pick up a first down if they need to with their legs. And it was the second week in a row that uh, the opposition uh, was driving towards the end of the game to tie in the second week in a row that Aaron Terry snuffed out those hopes with the pick at the end of this time. It was he, I thought as soon as he picked that ball up, he might have had a chance to go 100 yards the other way. Unfortunately, there was just one or two people in his way, but... Um, California's defense did a pretty good job with the, the interception. I know Jordan Bowman had one uh, in the second quarter, and then Aaron Terry at the end of the game. Those two guys, Bowman and Terry, are some of the biggest ball hawks I think you'll see in the PSAC. Uh, there's that old adage, some of the guys play defense because they can't catch the ball. Uh, those two guys, I'm pretty sure, could play offense and defense the way their hands are. Uh, Bowman, every game it seems like he's around some sort of takeaway. He forced a fumble as well and had a pick. So, I mean, that guy, before he's all said and done, might be one of those top guys in terms of takeaways in school history uh, since he's only a junior. And Terry, uh, I mean, you can see his skills on special teams last week. Uh, anytime he gets the ball in his hand, something uh, great can happen. Uh, but he also, he's one of those shutdown guys in the corner as a cornerback. Uh, they're pretty rare in this level. I mean, you probably haven't seen one here since Terrence Johnson, and that's some pretty high praise. And on the special team side, it seemed like last year, uh, every week we were talking about a kick block, but California, a little bit of a drought. I think uh, that's the first block kick that I can recall for this season, uh, but it came at a great time, a, a block field goal, stop momentum for Edinburgh in that game, but just another great special teams job uh, by California on, on Saturday. I mean, the Vulcans always put uh, tremendous athletes on special teams. They're not afraid to use their starters, uh, secondary guys. They don't really, they'll put their best athletes out there to try to make a play, especially uh, when they think they need a punt block. Uh, Larry Wilson's not afraid to send the guys in and go get it. Vondell Bell did it uh, this week. I don't think it's his first time he's been involved in, I think he had one in Lockhaven last year. So uh, they have some guys that length and athleticism that just have that knack to go find the ball and either block it, tip it, whatever you need to do, pick it up and t turn it. Well, that's about all the, the verbiage we can put on that uh, game from pa this past Saturday. Let's take a look at the highlights from a beautiful fall afternoon in Edinburgh, Pennsylvania. And then after the break, you'll see highlights from last year's game against this coming week's opponent, Seton Hill. You're watching Vulcans Football 2015 right here on CUTV. Harris. Pitch toss. Franklin to the right. Franklin, touchdown, California. John Franklin's fifth touchdown of the season gives the Vulcans a 6-0 lead. He'll take the snap. Hand off. Averland again tries to spin up a tackle and gets ripped. The ball is out. Harris. Hand off. Franklin. Quick hand off. Touchdown, California. John Franklin's got two in the first quarter. Back to pass. He looks pressure. He's in the end zone. That's a safety. He got hit from the blind side. That's principal. Ball is spotted. It's way in. It gets blocked. He looks like he kicked it low. And the oh, bad snap. Fumble. Edinburgh football. It was a bad handoff to Franklin, and Edinburgh stops California. He rolls to the right here. Sisson 
looking, looking. Now the pressure cuts back, fires. He's got it. Ball popped out and intercepted. It is intercepted. Jordan Bowman. Ball spotted. Kicks away. That kick is good. He rolls to the left this time. He looks. He looks. Corner end zone. Massey gets the touchdown. Harris back to pass. He looks. He wants Gary Brown. Touchdown. Falcons. Gary Brown. Back to pass. He looks. He fires. He's got Smory wide open for the touchdown. Luke Smory was left uncovered. Listen back to pass again. He looks. He fires. He wants his man. And it is caught for the touchdown. Darren Massey. Harris, back to pass out of shotgun. He looks, he fires, he's got Scott wide open. Scott loses the football. Edinburgh will recover it. Scott slipped in a turn, second turnover for California. He takes the snap again, back to pass. That time, he's got his man, that's Massey. Five yard line, breaking tackle, still on his feet, touchdown! Unbelievable, this guy. Handoff, Franklin up the middle, finest lane, he goes to the end zone, James Franklin, John Franklin, his third touchdown of the game. Back to pass assist, and he looks, lost pass, he wants Caratelli, he's got him open, he got it, and he will go in for the touchdown. Edinburgh with another touchdown, at his assistant's fourth touchdown pass of this game. Harris back to pass, he looks, he's got time. Throws it right and intercepts it. Hands off, Villiard, play action, looks, fires, intercepted, Aaron Terry! An unbelievable interception, Aaron Terry continues to fight. The time is now, the place is here, stop running, face your fear. When it all comes down to this, you only get one shot, can't afford to miss. The time is now, the place is here. Stop running, face your fear. When it all comes down to this, you only get one shot, can't afford to miss. So, let's get it, let's go. Go hard and go home. Since 1937, the Student Association Incorporated, known as SAI, has served the Cal U student body by providing activities, programs, and services. Every enrolled student has the ability to take part in over 125 different clubs and organizations. Managing participation in every SAI activity is easy with OrgSync, a powerful tool for staying connected. Located one mile from campus, the SAI farm has 94 acres of meeting and recreational space. SAI, it's your student association. For almost 30 years, CUTV has been the campus and community home for local news, sports, and entertainment. Broadcast in 100,000 homes in southwestern Pennsylvania, CUTV provides complete coverage of Vulcan sports as well as high school football coverage. Broadcast weekly live, CUTV News Center provides coverage of local and campus events, weekend weather, sports highlights, and feature stories. For more information on CUTV, check us out on the web, friend us on Facebook, or follow us on Twitter. Dropping back to pass. Oh my goodness, look out, fumble. Seton Hill says they've got it. Here's Drew Jackson on fourth down, ready to pass. Fires into the end zone, caught for the Griffin touchdown. So now Harris is under center. Once again, Roberson on the call, spinning away from the defender into the end zone for the California touchdown. Snap, drops back to pass, caught by Gary Brown. And it's a fumble right at midfield. Who's gonna dive on it? There, Seton Hill saying they have it again. Here it comes. Dropping back to pass, air mails it to the corner of the end zone. Does he have his man? 
Yes, he does. It's a California touchdown in the corner of the end zone. Kawan Scott on the reception. And there's a fumble on the field, in the backfield. Who gets it? it? Looks like California has it. Branko Pusick on the recovery there. Nuzo, kick is up, kick splits the uprights, it is good. Harris, dropping back to pass, sacked, fumbled, and recovered by Seton Hill. Now it's second down and goal, retry. Here's the snap, it is down, kick is blocked. Kick is blocked by the Balkans. And in the backfield, one receiver on the left, he hands it off to Roberson. Roberson pushes through, plows through, giving California the touchdown. Harris hands it off to his running back, that's Roberson. Roberson finds a hole up the middle, into the end zone for the Roberson California here. touchdown. Jackson has a receiver on his right and one man in the backfield. He hands it off to his fullback and he goes into the end zone for the Seton Hill touchdown. It's going to be fumbled but picked up and he's gonna run with it back to the 30 yard line. Welcome back to Vulcans Football 2015. Uh, I'm Gary Smith, your host, joined by Matt Kiefer, Sports Information Director. And you just saw highlights of last year's uh, PSAC West showdown between the Seton Hill Griffins and the California Vulcans at Historic Offutt Field. And as I was telling Matt off camera, and I'll tell you at home, Offutt Field is the uh, site of a historic Josh Gibson home run. Hit like about a 600-foot home run, as the legend goes. Uh, it landed somewhere, if you remember on the highlights, the brick building in the, uh, the right side of the screen. So. A little bit of nuggets. You never know what kind of history you're going to find in the PSAC West. It's always one of those things. I know the <laughs> Pullman Park for baseball has all those historic players there. I didn't know about that one. So Heck yeah. Um, and a lot more history because that's uh, only the second time uh, ever California played Seton Hill as a conference member. Uh, third time ever. Uh, the first time coming several years ago in the, P uh, the NCAA playoffs. Uh, and Seton Hill is one of those teams that since they joined the PSAC, much like whenever Gannon and Mercer joined, uh, they become a lot more competitive a lot quicker than they did in the WIVAC, their old conference. I mean, when they made the, the NCAA playoffs in 2008, everybody thought, okay, this is that team that's going to start making that run, the Wiviax program, uh, private school, fully funded, or whatever they wanted to do. Well, it didn't really go as planned. Uh, they've gone through a couple of different head coaches since then, a couple no-win seasons, a couple of one-win seasons, a couple of two-win seasons. Uh, but since coming to the PSAC, uh, you can look at their roster. They're one of the few schools in the conference that goes truly out of state uh, to get a lot of their talent. And uh, this week they pulled off probably their biggest upset victory in program history, or at least since 2008. And we'll get to that in a little bit, but uh, we'll tease a little bit. Seton Hill knocking off the uh, preseason number one uh, Slippery Rock. Uh, but we'll get to that in the standings. But as you mentioned, Seton Hill's one of those teams that they're, they're building, and this is a team that you really can't uh, look past because you saw the highlights last year. Uh, even though California was up, Seton Hill chipped away, and uh, the coach that was, is there now, you know, he took a Widener team in D3 outside of Philadelphia and made them a powerhouse, and he's kind of doing the same thing there. I mean, it's one of those things, uh, they've played them twice in the PSAC school. Uh, both times you would think, okay, Cal on paper is going to go in there and win by a touchdown or two. In every game, we've seen them both. Uh, they're hard-fought games. They're nothing easy. That's one of those things, uh, almost like that Edinburgh team of Scott Browning, the way he coaches. Uh, it's just nothing that's given to you easily there. Uh, struggle to turnovers, struggles with penalties when we've played them before, but if they're improving the way they look like they could be on paper, uh, those are two things you probably wouldn't be able to do this time around and be able to get away with it. I mean, penalties are one of those things uh, I'm sure we'll touch base a little bit later on. Uh, that's just something that's been plaguing the Vulcans all year long. Yeah, we talked about it in the first part of the show. A couple of special teams plays were called back because of penalties. And it, it, we're getting to the part of the year uh, when your conference play, every down, it seems like it's going to be in the PSAC, both in the East and West, is going to be so important. You can't really give away yardage one way or the other. I, mean, I was talking to somebody who was at the game uh, with the Slippery Rock Seton Hill game. I mean, everybody thought, okay, Slippery Rock's going to go in there and roll. Uh, Slippery Rock, I think, scored first. Like, no big surprise. But then Seton Hill made a huge uh, drive and got, just countered it right away. And I think people were starting to say, okay, well, maybe we can go back on. Well, per penalties, turnovers in the red zone, missed field goals. Uh, the quarterback, Christian Strong, threw for over 300 yards in the first half. 
So that's something you got to be careful of if you have a guy who can play that way as a quarterback. And I think this, this Seton Hill team and also uh, Seton Hill as a whole, I think that's going to become a nice rivalry for California, both schools. Uh, we've seen it in the last couple of years, a lot on basketball. Um, when the women's team beat our women's team a couple of years ago, kept us out of the playoffs. The men's games have been close. Volleyball has been close. Uh, and, a, and the football rivalry starts getting close. This could be a nice rivalry between California and Seton Hill because they're only separated by about 35, 40 minutes. I mean, you look at the PSAC, almost every school has at least one school that's within an hour drive, except Cal. Cal is always that one outlier that had some had to go to IEP or something like to get it. So if you can go 45 minutes down the road, something it's easy for both fan bases to get to back and forth, students and alumni. Uh, in a nice city for Greensburg, if you want to come more rural, uh, obviously California would be uh, that option for you as well. Uh, but it's been one of those nice things to see. They've found a way to become a dominant baseball program in the PSAC uh, with the way they uh, – run their program a great uh, job by their coach um, but those other basketball programs along with their other sports they're ultra competitive and it's going to be one of those things that i think you're going to start to see the three psac uh, schools that are private uh gannon mercer and seton hill they'll start to pull themselves maybe not away uh, but definitely challenged across the board in multiple sports where before it's like okay maybe one or two sports uh, they might be best at and uh, that's about all we can say uh, for the seton hill team or seton hill team for 2015. Let's take a look at around the PSAC. As we touched upon, it was a crazy weekend uh, in both the East and the West with the scoreboards. You see California, Edinburgh, we talked about that 37 30. Upset number one, Clarion might be for real, at least more for real than what people were thinking, uh, beating uh, a heavily favored Gannon. And actually, I believe Gannon was the preseason number one in the PSAC. I think I misspoke earlier. 47 31. Um, and Matt, none of us expected that. I didn't see Clarion scoring 47 points probably in about two or three weeks combined after what you've seen from previous years. Uh, but the way their offense is running right now, they're putting up some big numbers. Great job by that new head coach up there. Uh, obviously running his system the way he wants to and uh, putting, doing some special things there and putting Clarion back on the map, a place they haven't been probably since 2010 or 9 uh, when they came here and had that uh, great ultra-competitive game up at Apsom <laughs> Stadium in, in the rain. In the rain. I was going to say, that was a miserable afternoon. Uh, this next score would have been an upset, I think, any other week. IEP over Mercyhurst um, at Mercyhurst. Uh, Mercyhurst was also a preseason pick to, to finish pretty high. But Mercyhurst has yet to beat IEP since they've been in the PSAC. I mean, Mercyhurst is one of those things, uh, you never know really what you're getting week to week. I mean, they were playing ultra uh, strong, basically. You're coming in 3 0, something I don't know if they've ever done really before. Uh, in their franchise in their program history uh but indiana it's one of those top dogs they, they've been there before uh signetti has his troops ready to go to open up west play and then the upset of the week uh seton hill over slip rock 41 38 we were actually met at the uh, cranberry buffalo wild wings eating and uh, there was a group of slip rock fans following the game i guess on live stats at another table and you heard a groan uh come up from that tv we heard a cheer come up from our table and then abraham lincoln walked in the buffalo wild wings totally Disrupting the entire afternoon. That's actually a true story that Abraham Lincoln came into the Buffalo Wild Wings with, in a Pirates hat. So you never know what's going to happen on a Saturday in the PSAC, but that upset is shocking. That is a truly definition of Wild Wild West. Cal was basically probably the only team that would be probably favored on paper going into this week uh, to win. And even then, looking at the score, uh, it was a pretty tight game. Now let's go over to the PSAC East to see what happened over there. Uh, competitive game, East Stroudsburg over Lock Haven. Uh, I don't think anybody saw that being a three-point game. Lock Haven had a chance to win it with a field goal late Ooh. and just missed it. So, I mean, it would be one of those things. East Stroudsburg would really be struggling if that would have uh, gone through and Lock Haven would be able to pull that win out at home. And I believe that since you said missed field goal, I believe Slippery Rock missed a 22-yarder that would have sent that game into to extra extra time. Uh, Quitstown, no surprise, 34-0 over Cheney. Uh, Westchester continuing the uh, the Millersville struggles. I believe with Millersville, Millersville has been outscored something like 78 to three in the last two weeks. Uh, rough season in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. And then the final score, Bloomsburg, Shippensburg. Um, not really surprised there, and I figured that was going to be a hard fought game. I, I figured there'd be a little bit more points put up on the board. But I mean, Cal saw both those teams. I think I'd see a little bit more than. Uh, the 20-some points that were scored in that game. But Bloomsburg knew that their season was on the line after losing to Mercier, so they really needed to come out and impress in East play. Uh, where Shippensburg, they still had a couple holes you could see they needed to work on, but Bloomsburg, uh, one of those perennial top 25 teams, playoff teams, they needed, to, needed that win badly to put themselves back, at least in the discussion, uh, come later in a couple of weeks. And I tell you what, even though it's early in the season, we're going to look at the standings now. Um, you don't want to see too many losses if you want to think about P or NCAA playoff berths uh, later on in end of October, early November. Um, after the first week of conference play, you see the, all the teams that are 1-0, Clarion, California, IEP, and Seton Hill. 
uh, and then Gannon, Mercer, Sleeper Rock, and Edinburgh all 0 and 1. And you can see uh, the only remaining undefeated team in the PSAC are the Clarion Golden Eagles at 4 and 0. Um, so there's going to be a lot of shakeups here as we go through the season. As we go over the PSAC East, uh, there's not a lot of margin for errors for these teams um, if they're still thinking about NCAA playoff burst because you see the teams that are 1-0, Bloomsburg, Stroudsburg, Kutztown, and Westchester, uh, all are 1-0. Uh, but you see on the, the overall record, there's no team in the PSAC East that has less than two losses, and that's a tough road to hoe. I mean, they're definitely glad on guaranteeing the PSAC East right now that there's that extra playoff berth uh, for at least them to be even considered because if you'd run the table and win the state game with two losses, you'd probably be okay. But if you lose that state game and take a third loss, you're really putting uh, your fate in the, the committee's hands there, which is something you never really want to do. Uh, but there's still so much football left to be played. Uh, you never know when these teams may run off seven, eight wins in a row and just become one of those true dominant teams uh, just with an early season struggle. I mean, we've seen that with Cal before. Yeah. Uh, they've struggled one and two, two and one, something like that. And they've gone on to reach the NCAA semifinals. So nothing's out of the question uh, in terms of if you get off to a slow start, but you can't let it linger for much too much longer than you can have right now. Let's take a look at what's coming up this weekend of uh, action in the PSAC. There's an upcoming schedule in chronological order, so uh, you can figure out when you want to follow the games. Uh, Westchester, Lock Haven, Slipper Rock, Gannon, Seton Hill, at California, and the list goes on uh, from noon to 6 o'clock, full day uh, games. Matt, what's the game other than the Seton Hill, California? Because I know me and you will be both there uh, for about nine hours on Saturday. What's the other game, uh, if you're a fan, you should look at? I think you look at Slippery Rock Gannon. Both those teams come in one loss right now. Uh, you'd really hate to start the year own, too, but somebody's going to out of there. And then also, the Mercer's at mm -hmm. Clarion. It's at home for Clarion. Can they continue to ride this momentum? Uh, maybe start out 5-0 and and put Mercer's really in the deep hole 0-2, but a deep hole for Mercer's is nothing really to be too surprising for them. Uh, they're used to that, but it'd uh, be a good chance for Clarion to see if they can, what they can get in terms of their fan base to come out because they haven't been 4-0 for a while and have yeah. this much positive news uh, coming out of the, with the Golden Eagles. And definitely, I mean, every game in the West – uh, is pretty much a toss-up. Maybe the in Edinburgh at Indiana, but we saw Edinburgh this week put a scare on us. And IEP struggling yeah. against anybody uh, week to week. It just always depends uh, who, how they play. And as we see here, we're going to take a look at uh, how you, as the California Vulcan fans, can keep up with the action against the Seton Hill Griffins. Uh, you see Saturday, October 3rd. It's 1 o'clock at Adamson Stadium. Uh, you can watch online at calvulcans.com, the CUTV feed. And uh, me and Matt are both uh, pretty confident that uh, the minor issues that we've been having, it's a, it's a, it's a learning process, uh, but I think you'll be able to watch that. If for some reason uh, the power goes out in the stadium or the internet fails all across western Pennsylvania, uh, you can listen to it live on WCAL 91.9 FM online only. As it's a home game, we have to turn the transmitters down so they don't uh, have the uh, Bill Belichick interference on the headsets. Or uh, also, it's probably safe not to have 3,300 watts above about 3,000 people. Um, but you can also watch the live broadcast, like we mentioned, on CalValcans.com. Uh, tape delay on CUTV Monday at 6, Tuesday at 4. Or you can always watch the highlights and full games at uh, CUTV Sports 1, our YouTube page. Usually uh, we're able to get those highlights up Monday afternoon, and usually the games, the full games are up either Monday evening or Tuesday morning. So once again, there's no, no good reason not to follow along with your Vulcans. And also, if all else fails... Matt and his staff do a wonderful job of live tweeting uh, everything, follow along live stats. Again, there's going to be a quiz next week, so make sure you study up. And um, like I said, there's no real good reason to say I, I have no idea what's going on in Vulcan football. Beauty 2015, you really can't escape. Every, it's it's every, <laughs> Information's everywhere, so if you want it, you can go find it pretty easily. And Matt has said off camera that if all else fails, he, he will offer an interpretive dance the entire Seton Hill game for a half hour next week on the show. So maybe we should be rooting for technology to go down. So I uh, hate to put you on the spot there, but that, that's that I last this, thing we I can offer. I think this cold might be getting worse uh, already. I can predict for next week. So I'm going to be able to make it in. I might send a GA in. <laughs> Fair enough. Other duties as a sign, right? Yes. <laughs> well, that's it for Vulcans Football 2015. Hope to see a lot of red and black in the stands at Adamson Stadium. Saturday afternoon, 1 o'clock. Should be a beautiful afternoon for football. Once again, for Matt Kiefer, I'm Gary Smith. You're watching Vulcans Football 2015 right here on CUTV.